ハギャ様何の疑問もなく口にしたその一言がウェルフィンとブロブーダに疑念を持たせたとの知らずにイカルモはファームの姿を求め宮殿の地下へと向かっていた Oh, I can't go careful now. <laughs> okay, he's got those as well, right? I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm going to go to the 今、パームは命を懸けている。それだけでイカルゴは彼女を尊敬できた。Oh, I just got chills, man. The flute? 任務でも義務でもない。He chooses to do, do this, right? 助けると決めたから。宮殿地下へのエレベーター。I salute you, エカルゴ。重量計を内蔵したエレベーターは、効果は自由に行えるが、上昇時には1名しか乗らず、そして暗証番号の入力が求められる。Okay, only applies if you're going back up. なる番号は一人一人異なり、利用者の識別が可能となる。番号登録時の身体データと、利用者のデータが著しく異なる場合、即刻警報が鳴り。Okay, this is about to play a major part, isn't it? Surely. How did Pom get up here then? Oh, okay, that might be it. Maybe Marcos gave his code. The jock strap. Ah, that's right. The decomposing body. I didn't even think of that. I just thought it wasn't a thing at play. Because no one mentioned it. Oh, is that short for bravura? Oh, I, just, I was just going to ask, can he sense or pick up on... Oh. <laughs> ブロウダブロウは背後で俺を見ていた。Oh、He's going down that rabbit hole.What if situations? ブロウが続とグルならば、俺がフラッタの不自然さに気づいたことに気づいたはず。ならば、やつが先に下へ降りた理由は<笑>下で俺を、oh. It's a logical thought. It is. Right? You see how he got to that. Yeah, I haven't seen Bizef in a bit. <laughs> yes. Go on then. Oh, look at those eyes. He sees it too. He's changed. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's it. Ooh. <laughs> He'll leave it to Kilua. Eh? Zeno's seen some things in there, some surprising things. He knows how much the girl means to the king. He'll let Kilua decide for himself. That was always to be expected, right? A lot of detours. <laughs> Look at that thing. <laughs> adorable, adorable. <laughs> Ooh. Rapid evolution, eh? Oh, this is gonna annoy him. <laughs> I need to get a plushie of that. Oh, yeah. Okay. He's playing right into Knuckles' hands. Ooh. 
Ooh. Okay, careful, not knuckle. The blades of death. He might not have any control over that. Hmm. Just that one eye means so much to him. Ah, yeah. Taking that one eye from him. Oh, yeah, he's, he's not gonna... His body's given out. I salute you as well. Shoot. Oh, look at this. Crying for shoot. Ha. That's the bond that they've all developed. I mean, no one's around. He could kind of come out of the ability, right? Real quick. No? But yeah, you never know who's on, on the side of the door or something. The walk. Okay. Ooh. Kind of reminds me of Krolo against Silva and Xenozolidic. The staging for it. And a lot of different characters at play in terms of the Chimera Ants. It's a great shot. The perspective there. Yeah, they're locked in. Interesting. Oh my god. Not him. Anyone but him. Yeah, you don't say. Huh? I've seen it. And he's sharp, razor sharp as well, isn't he? Inquisitive. Oh my god. Okay, 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 okay. Calm down, man. Collect yourself. Oh. He might pick up on him, man. Of course he did. But it's kind of landing on his radar now. Now slowly, just inch out of here. It's realistic though, he's really afraid at the moment to move. <laughs> Goddamn thong. Eggman? Sonic reference, maybe? <laughs> Looks a little goofy. It's an interesting approach, not showing us Ik uh, not Ikago, Melioron anymore. Uh, I certainly hope he's not standing in the corner anymore. Ooh. So they can't, yeah? They can't perceive him. But they still... Ah. So they did... Whoa. Close call, man. No one? Hmm. It's a clever fellow, man. <laughs> Don't trust anyone, even yourself. Big target on your back, right? 
Yeah. Yeah, it registered. Look at this. Ah. Ooh, a lot of logical conclusions. I mean, it doesn't have to be specifically from him, but it still kind of makes sense. Oh, he's getting quite the focus here in this episode. He's having a moment. Look at this. Whoa. Look at this. Possibly a new ally. On the horizon. Oh. Oh my god, look at this. Yes, look at that. Oh, beautifully animated. Now he understands. Zeno. Oh. Killua, I don't think it's about to make a difference to Gon. Oh. My god. Huh. Look at that, it's the exact same shot. Exact same shot from 85. Rolls of it reversed though. Oh my god. It's his aura this time that's disturbing. Pff, really disturbing. Wow. Okay, so 30 episodes later, right? 30 episodes later, they've arrived at this scene. And, you know, it's essentially a bit of a carbon copy. But the roles have been reversed. Uh, this time, it's Nefropito's turn to look on defenseless, right? At least in that really specific moment. Um, and even, you know, the head turn, it's the exact same shot. But the context is a bit different this time, isn't it? Right, because the shot might be the same, you know, her kind of looking over the shoulder, right? It's an iconic shot, actually, of this anime, I think, even beyond just the Chimera Ant arc, just that shot of her, that initial shot of her that they've utilized uh, on multiple occasions throughout this arc, right? Uh, and the impact of that moment, uh, specifically mentally as well, right? Uh, I've seen some really, uh, you know, great shots of that or different takes or different shots of that moment. Those piercing, lingering, murderous eyes, right? Of uh, Nefropito from episode 85. But now, as she looks back over the shoulder, <laughs> she's the one who's taking in or looking on as Gon's bloodlust is taking over. Uh, the vengeful spirit is plain to see on his face and it's beautifully detailed and animated. I mean, the final frame of this episode, that tight shot of Gon, right? Again, surrounded by that really specific, um, you know, visual depiction of aura, right? Again, it's uh, it's it's essentially a carbon copy. You could easily just substitute um, Nefropito from episode 85 into that. I mean, this is someone that is essentially um, consumed by hatred at this point. And, you know, that, that idea of men being affected by your emotional state uh, yeah, that's most definitely a play here. You know, there is legitimate hatred in those eyes. There is murderous intent in those eyes, in that aura, right? And Nefropito feels it. She understands it. Now listen, you know, uh, I said she's defenseless in that really specific moment, right? But, uh, you know, it's still kind of like a, even, you know, Nefropito without her um, men, or, you know, um, kind of focusing her Nen and her um, efforts on Komugi, she's still quite formidable, right? But I'm not even sure that she wants to fight at this moment, right? Because right now, her, her main focus is, is Komugi. It's as simple as that. I cannot see her, um, you know, uh, calling back Dr. Blythe, removing that you know, uh, life-saving surgery. She's in the middle of it. Hell, it's not even in the middle of it. You know, even though it's been a few episodes at this point, it's only been at most a few minutes, you know, since she actually started, right? The process of it. So it's still early days 
for Komugi. She needs a lot of attention. And listen, I'll be honest, you know, I fear for Komugi. Isn't that crazy that, you know, I'm saying that? Because on the opposite end of it is Gone Freaks. Someone I adore, someone I've come to love so much alongside Killua as well, right? Um, but, you know, looking at that final frame, uh, looking at him just walking up on her in that moment, it does not feel like the Gone I know. The Gone whose passion has lent uh, strength to the people around him. Right, including Killua, who's standing by his side, right? Who wanted to be by his side. And you see Killua's initial reaction, you know, the close-up of his eyes, right? Now he understands. Now he understands the parting, um, you know, the parting words of his grandpa. I'll let you draw your own conclusions of uh, the things that are happening inside. Killua is a little bit puzzled at that moment. But you know, ultimately it appears that you know Zeno um, chooses to trust Killua's ability and judgment, right? Uh, and, they, and that he essentially wants him to arrive at his own conclusions from that, right? And of course, nothing has to be stated. All of us know Killua enough to know that he understands that, okay, this is a tricky situation. This is not the situation they, they kind of expe expected to walk into. It simply isn't. You know, it's similar. The setup is similar to, you know, the chairman and Zeno walking in on an injured Komugi or the king holding an injured Komugi. There, you know, it's clear that they felt it's, it, it would be inhumane to proceed right, to attack, to engage, to try something there. Now, you, you can see, again, you can see that Killua has kind of arrived at the same conclusion. But Gon, on the other hand, I don't know, man, this is the reason I said I, I fear for Komugi, because at this point, I don't know if, if that really truly matters to Gon, if, if that even registers. And, you know, if it registers, uh, I'll find out soon enough. I don't think, I don't think he's about to take a backseat all of a sudden, I don't think he's about to, you know, just um, hang around uh, until <laughs> Nefropito's done. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, at this point in time, I, I, I find it difficult to actually picture that, you know. Um, and I feel like it's really quite deliberate. You know, again, the final shot of him, you know, walking up to her. Just the, the really specific visual uh, depiction of his intent at that point. His intentions at that point. Listen, man, is the gone that all of us love uh, completely about to go away? Right? Is there a possibility of that happening? Um, you know, I've been speculating. I've been, I've been kind of fearing something like this. Right now, actually seeing him come across Nefropito, all it really did is kind of, you know, <laughs> drive that point home even more. I'm even more concerned that you know, Gone uh, could completely just lose himself. Right? And I listen. Uh, you know, back in the York New City arc, there's that really specific, significant moment. You know, Gon tells Killua, you know, it's my job to do um, stupid things, uh, you know, dumb things. That's not the exact term he used, but something along those lines. And then he tells Killua, it's your job to stop me from doing it, right? It's your job to step in and stop me. I feel like this might be one step too far. I feel like this is not going to be the type of thing that Killua can stop him from. Um, listen, I feel like he'll certainly... Uh, step in, right? He'll try to talk to him, but I, I, I don't think you're talking gone out of anything in this. You know, the only one, the only one that is about to drive the situation in there, in that room, is Gone Freaks. It's as simple as that. I, I really firmly believe that at this point. You know, he holds that room. You know, the shame and the guilt that he's been carrying since the NGL incident, since the Kite NGL incident, it really threatens to fuel this self destructive nature. The self-destructive tendencies that Gon does have, and you know, that's not that's not something that's developed, you know, in the aftermath of the NGL incident. That's always been a part of Gon. It's always been there since the beginning. You know, the self-destructive tendencies um, and the guilt aspect of it. And like I mentioned a few moments ago, Gon's attitude, his demeanor, this blind rage again, that's threatening to essentially just take over completely. Um, and actually, it appears to have taken over already. Again, you know, going by that final frame, um, you know, that, that frame right there is, it's, it's one of those haunting images, isn't it? Right? To see someone like gone in that state, right? Um, surrounded by that aura uh, or that visual depiction of aura. It's, yeah, it's, it's one of those things I'm not going to forget. You know, there's a lot of moments in this anime that I'll never forget that are essentially part of the core memory of this anime for me. You know, recently it was the Dragon Dive episode. There's a lot of imagery there and moments there that are just, you know, iconic moments. You know, the types of moments that define a story arc, um, a plot, an anime. This is another case of that, I think, for me at least. And you know, the thing is, 
it, it puts the audience, or you know, maybe I should just speak for myself. It puts me in a really tricky position because you know, at this point, I'm a little bit more. Uh, you know, concern for Tomugi and Nefropito. Listen, I like Nefropito. I do. You know, I've I've enjoyed the growth of Nefropito as well, right? Even though it might be subtle at times, uh, but it's certainly there. You know, it's certainly much more recently as well. Um, you know, given her um, almost life changing experience with her king just quite recently, right? I mean, hell, he could even be looking at this as karma, right? Because last they saw each other, Pito, you know, walked in on them. You know, uh, I mean, launched in on them and on him and his friends, right? People he cared about. And at that point, all of them are terrified, including Kai, right? Who ultimately um, understands that, uh, yeah, this is it. You know, this is probably the end of him. But, you know, at that point, he's a bit more concerned about getting gone and Killua out of there, right? Um, yeah, you, they're caught by surprise. And now, uh, the you know, the tables have turned. I almost did the Michael Scott, how the turn tables. <laughs> All right, all right, let's get back into this. But yeah, the, you know, the tables have turned. Now it's gone who walks in on, uh, you know, an innocent bystander uh, in the middle of life-saving surgery and someone that is essentially defenseless at this point at least, right? Um, in Nefropito. So much like Kite in that moment, you know, Nefropito is not at her full capacity, you know, because Kite had gone in Killua on his mind, right? That's just the, the fact of the matter. He could not. He could not completely dial in and devote himself to the incoming challenge. And again, he lost an arm for it. And then, of course, his life. Uh, you know, later that night or into the morning. And I think there's actually an interesting contrast here at play, right? If you look at Gone and if you look at Meduem, because you see at this point. I mean, it's kind of clear to see at this point that you know Gone is losing his humanity. But then, of course, you know, if you contrast that with Meduem, who's in the middle of a self-discovery, beginning to showcase the humanity within him. Right, tapping into it, um, tapping into something that certainly already existed within him. Right, the power to change is there. Uh, you know, to find your true self. That's always been there for Med Women. He's on that path again. You know, like I said, uh, there's an interesting detour, uh, or perhaps the next phase of this self-discovery aspect of it. Right, again, now he's been uh, paired up with his true nemesis. Right. Uh, the chairman, Netro. So that's going to be the next phase of his self-discovery and the things that transpire um, throughout that um, encounter. So yeah, it's a really interesting approach, isn't it, by Tagashi? Um, and then, yeah, you know, there's always been that notion of, you know, Gon and Killua going in opposite directions, right? Gon, again, uh, you know, descending into the darkness, into the abyss, um, and Killua being the light. Uh, truly being the light. I mean, you look at the focus on the eyes. You know, there's been quite a focus on the eyes, but even more so in this episode, right? You see that Killua's eyes depict clarity and growth and maturity. And you see that as Zeno sees it. You know, there's a beautiful shot of, of his eyes. I mean, the eyes themselves look so beautiful, right? Killua's eyes. Um, it's like looking into, um, I don't know, the galaxy almost. I felt that it was kind of by, uh, you know, by design to, to have his eyes kind of look like that. Um, and of course, Xenozolidic immediately noticed that there's been a change within uh, Killua, right? He didn't. He didn't say anything else, right? And it'll, it let's, it'll be interesting if he's to, you know, share any of this with Silva Zolidic. Um, again, you know, I, I know there's not going to be any scenes of his follow up or anything. You know, just I'm just kind of thinking about moments that that are kind of like off screen, you know. But yeah, he he understood that, okay, you know, any type of programming or uh, the, you know, the hole that the needle had on him, that's certainly not there anymore, right? Because he's here. <laughs> he's here. He's in the middle of this incredible conflict, right? And he's uh, a major aspect of it. He He's part of the group, the extermination squad, right? And as expected, you know, um, Zeno had no intentions of uh, getting him out of there. Hell, he didn't say much at all, actually. Other than a few choice words, um, I could have used maybe a little bit more of Zeno, but you know it doesn't feel out of character or anything. Though of course there's that moment as the narrator specified that you know Zeno essentially had to swallow his words, right? The things he wanted to say or share with Killua, but instead he chooses to trust Killua's ability and judgment, right? Um, he he wants him to come to his own conclusion because he knows he knows you know Killua's part of a plan. Again, part of a, you know, of a group that's, you know, put together all of these things. Uh, and he does not have all of that information. He, he essentially said, said as much, right? Uh, my job here is done. 
And yeah, you know, of course, Zeno understands that the girl is really quite important to the king, right? Given the scene he walked in on, um, uh, the really surprising scene at that, you know, these are things that he, he did not expect. You know, I touched up on this again in the last episode, you know, the king himself, you know, his demeanor, his disposition, and then just him caring for a civilian in that, you know, manner. It's it just kind of flipped everything upside down for him. Right? This is not the thing that was described to him. Though, of course, you know, the chairman didn't know any of this either. Right, Even the chairman can only know so much until you actually face uh, the situation itself uh, in the flesh. But to go back to my point about the eyes and you know, those being a major focus, yeah, you know, uh, it's quite the contrast, isn't it? Because Gon's eyes are murky. They're dark. Right? There's that murderous intent. Um, there's that aspect of tunnel vision right? that he is locked in dialed in um and he only sees one thing one thing and, and again it threatens to just completely consume him the hatred and you know the crazy thing about all of it is that this is gone before he truly even understands that kite is gone for good that kite that he knew he's gone he's gone for good so i mean it's you know it's all kind of right there you know and it's it's a scary thought if gone is like this right now it, just imagine, you know, I mean, it's, ooh, I just got, I just kind of got chills on my uh, arm here. Um, yeah. And, you know, regardless of how he arrived at that conclusion that, you know, yeah, you know, Kite's still out there. He's savable. I'll fix him. Um, listen, my immediate thought back in episode 85 was that he's deluded himself. You know, it's it, somehow his mind has allowed him to, you know, fight on and, you know, just kind of latch onto this idea. No, 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 no. I choose to believe that he's out there. He's alive and, you know, he's fixable. I, I'll bring him back, you know, by defeating this chimera ant. But yeah, you know, an eye for an eye makes the world blind. Um, but you know, listen, listen, uh, let's see, you know, this is, in, this is the initial setup. And again, it's quite, uh, I mean, it's quite a damning setup as well, but let's see how it plays out. You know, I'm, I'm expecting the next episode to be at least, uh, you know, a solid portion of it to be, uh, focused on this, you know, I mean, I, I certainly hope for it because, you know, I, I, given the situation, given the gravity of the situation, you know, I don't think you can kind of cut in, um, a lot of the other moments, right? At least give it a solid segment, you know, at least half of the episode, you know? Um, it, it's just not, it's just not the type of thing you can cut away from. But yeah, let's see how it all plays out. Uh, I'm sure it's going to have a few more surprises for me, right? A few more twists and turns, perhaps. Um, you know, maybe maybe Gone might surprise me. Uh, you know, listen, I know I've had a bit of a yap session here about, um, you know, the path he's heading toward. And essentially, I've been giving good reason to expect that. But you, I don't know, man. Let's see. Let's see. You know, I don't want to, you know, I was about to say that there's the, I mean, the signs of a negative change arc um, are certainly at play. But I don't want to go too far into that possibility just yet. You know, let me let me get to the next episode and perhaps uh, the next couple of episodes. Um, and then, you know, let's kind of reassess um some of the ideas of a negative change arc now let's shift the focus to the rest of the episode um you know honestly speaking it's not really the type of episode that i was expecting you know in the middle of this um i'm not saying that it's you know it, it's a disappointing episode but it's it's it just not something i was expecting you know the at least the tone of it or maybe not the tone the, the pacing of it rather and you know the main focus of it you know for the most part for the most part it's a wealth in episode right? Prominently featured. And, you know, by the end of this episode, it's so clear. It's so clear that he is about to play a part, a major part in this arc, right? For the rest of this arc, or at some point in this arc. Uh, I mean, you know, I kind of speculated that uh, around the time I saw him, fo uh, you know, focused on or featured um, a few episodes ago. But yeah, you know, by the end of this one, it's clear, really quite clear that he is going to be playing uh, a significant part because, you know, essentially the screen time dictates it, right? In the, in the middle of this uh, portion of the arc, you know, the business end of the arc, essentially, um, the grand finale component of it, there's half an episode that's essentially dedicated to this character. Now, I like Rolfin, you know, like I stated before. But, you know, I feel like maybe he's being featured uh, a little bit late. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, it doesn't feel like it's um, legitimate or anything, you know, because I, I do feel like Walfin is uh, an interesting character. I just feel like, you know, they, they focused on much lesser ants, 
you know, um, long before they showed me wealth and especially in this capacity. Um, so, you know, why not, you know, why not introduce him a little bit earlier? Right. But again, you know, he is one of the ants that's uh, usually inside of the palace. Right. I saw him and the other one, Brovuda, I believe. Right. It, it, I mean, the spelling makes it look like that. It might, it might sound like bravado, but I think, yeah, I think it's Brovuda. Right. <laughs> he calls him bro for short from time to time. Now, listen, you know, by the end of it, he doesn't even know if he can trust uh, his friend, bro. Right. This is a skeptical dude. I mean, he is inquisitive, he's skeptical, he is paranoid, right? Highly paranoid. Uh, and it makes sense, you know, given uh, just his nature as a wolf, chimera ant, and, you know, his ability, his his keen sense of smell. Uh, it, it really kind of makes sense, right? So the spotlight, the development for this character, you know, I didn't mind it. It was just kind of unexpected, right? In the middle of all of this, because if you really truly look at it, it didn't move things along all that much for many of the other, you know, um, things that are at play, some really significant things, be it moral and Shalapuf up top in the in the throne room. Uh, I mean, you know, they, they mentioned it in passing. Uh, Melioron mentions it in passing. Again, he's another major focus of this one. Um, you know, last episode, there's quite the setup for Knuckle and Yupi, right? I get a bit of that, but you know, it's, 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 it's really quick, isn't it? Um, he's got Yuppie on the run and yeah of course as expected that's the approach here right um, annoy him um, get him frustrated but you know just just don't bite off more than you can chew Knuckle you know I'm excited but I'm also concerned for Knuckle it, it's quite a bit that he's taken on here quite the challenge um, you know Shoot is barely just hanging in there uh, he's got Melioron just crying and you know uh, I mean you know the, the sense of um, uh, friendship the bonds um, it's it, the brotherhood. It's it's really quite commendable, isn't it? I mean, I think it's really quite heartwarming just how much even shoot. Sorry, um, even Melioron has taken to shoot. You know, given his initial read on uh, shoot, right? It was kind of damning. It was really quite skeptical. But now he's you know he's shedding tears. But you know, I must admit, you know, I really thought he had a chance. You know, no one's around anymore. Yuppie's gone. He's chasing Knuckle. You know, he's really quite agitated because he couldn't get rid of APR either, right? Um, so I thought he had a moment. He easily could have, you know, um, uh, you know, come out of his uh, ability there, um, you know, God's plan, and you know, tell him to hang in there, fight, keep fighting, and all of that. But again, if he does that, then you know, just naturally for you know the flow of the story, it's going to require a conversation for those two characters, right? Um, but again, you know, maybe he's being extremely cautious just in case, you know, anyone picks up on his aura, his presence. But, you know, going back to that idea of, uh, you know, bonds and friendship and, you know, found family, right? I simply have to salute Ikalgo. My God, you know, his bravery, his uh, convictions, his resolve, right? His, his devotion, his dedication to his new found family of friends. And that includes someone like Palm because a friend of a friend is a friend of mine right? Um, this is, you know, I've, I said it uh, in his first appearance or second appearance, I suppose, you know, this is someone who's got character, a lot of character, and, you know, he truly wants to help her, and I love that, you know, these are the choices he's making for himself. He wants to be there, you know? There's no obligation here, right? He, he isn't being told that this has to be done. He chooses to do this with his new life that's essentially been given to him, and, you know, I've got to say one of the standout moments of the entire arc happened, you know? It's, it's a really familiar score, incredible, iconic score at this point, that uh, track. But it's it's just the flute part of it. I believe it's a flute, right? My God, there's something just so beautiful about that. And it just made so much sense to have that accompany that specific scene of Ikalgo's resolve, right? Oh, beautiful moment, man, beautiful moment. But again, you know, that being said, Ikalgo is, you know, he's in a bit of a tricky situation at the moment. He's got a few of them on his tail. Um, though, he you know, Welfin's kind of kind of moved on to other things by the end of it, you know, I mean, I'll get to that, I'll, I'll kind of go back to Welfin, but you know, um, at the least, he's got Bravuda on him, Bravuda, uh, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, um, so that encounter is, you know, a strong possibility, uh, you know, there's a strong security system, right, and it makes sense that uh, a palace does have a strong security system, and then, you know, I'm guessing that Palm was able to get up there because of Marcos's, um pin code, 
right? That's the only possibility here. Other other than that, you know, it's essentially a plot hole. But I don't think that's the case because you know they made it they made it really quite clear that there's only two that you know don't have to go through all of this, and that's Bizef and Marcos, right? So that you know that kind of checks out. Uh, but yeah, you know, again, there's a major unknown of Palm, right? It's kind of building and building. Um, I'm sure I'm in for a surprise because. I don't know, man. They, they just haven't mentioned it once. No one's mentioned it. You know, none of these Chimera Ants, uh, the Royal Guards, you know, Nefropita hasn't mentioned it, whose aura certainly caught her, or, you know, she was caught in the middle of it. So alongside Welfin being established as, um, you know, someone that can be a major player or is going to be playing a major part at some point in this arc, they made it really quite clear that the elevator um, component of it, right, the security system component of it is going to be playing a part. You know, soon enough, perhaps soon enough, because again, there's a lot of time dedicated to that segment, you know, a lot of time, perhaps a bit too much, if I'm being completely honest. But, you know, again, the fact that it is being um, showcased in such uh, length, yeah, it, you know, it's essentially a given that, okay, it's going to play a part. But going back to Welfin, you see that by the end of it, he's just highly suspicious of everything, including uh, perhaps himself, or at least his ability you know, uh, given the really unusual circumstances, um, because, you know, ultimately it should have, it really should have worked. But, you know, given, uh, uh, you know, Melioron's uh, unique ability and the, the fact that he got out of there before the, the missiles themselves could actually, you know, get to him, they just kind of end up doing nothing, right? Because they're not able to zone in on the target because the target's not there anymore. Um, so that's kind of insane. You know, once it's locked in, no one can escape it, right? Possibly OP. Let's see if, you know, that ability is going to be at play later on as well. But one of the things I really enjoyed about this focus on Rolfin is just, you know, how far down the rabbit hole he goes, you know, the what if scenarios, you know, one logical thought leads to another what if uh, scenario and thought. And then he just kind of keeps pulling at it, he keeps pulling at it. And by the end of it, he's not even sure if he's on the right side anymore or if he even, even should continue on the Chimera Ant side. Right, given the fact that there, there, there seems to be multiple traders as of this point, though you know they, soon enough they could become allies again because you know there's a possibility here that he could flip sides. Right, he's thinking about it. You know, he's contemplating it. He's like, is it even beneficial to stick around um, on this side anymore? Right, you know, why exactly are, are there so many traders from our side that are you know working with the enemy? Again, you know, enemy might not be the enemy anymore. Who knows? So yeah, you know, by the end of it, he's kind of doubting his own objectives, his uh, motives. I mean, by the end of it, it feels like going after Bizef doesn't even matter anymore. He's got other larger things to think about at this point. And, you know, I felt that there's a lot of realistic anxiety built in, right? Um, it, I think it makes sense. You know, he's really quite paranoid, but it, it kind of checks out given the situation he finds himself in and the things that he's picking up on. But this focus on Welfin just kind of reiterates that idea that, you know, this arc is essentially full of diverse character growth all over the place, all over the, the board, the map. But yeah, I think that does it for this one, folks. If you enjoyed that, consider dropping a like, consider dropping some comments, give me your thoughts. If you are interested in early access or timer based full length or full opacity, consider checking out the Patreon page. The links are in the description and the pinned comments. Also links to social media, if that's your thing. Right then, thank you so much for joining me, folks. And thank you for your time because time is precious. It really is. And I do hope to see you again soon for the next one. Until then, take it easy.